you, Lana. Beautiful job and powerful message this morning. If you have your Bible, would you turn with me this morning to three different passages of Scripture? You'll notice in our bulletin, Hosea chapter 10, Deuteronomy chapter 11, and James chapter 3. We're in a series together called Love Out Loud, and this morning I want us to think about renewed love, and we just have a few more Sundays in this series, and then we will kind of move around some in May, and then this summer We'll be walking through selected passages in First and Second Peter, so looking forward to what God is going to show us during the summer months. But this morning, I want to talk about what it means to have a renewed love. Every now and then, each of us needs to renew our love with God. His love is always the same. It's always steadfast. He never moves, but my love moves a lot. It tends to venture away from Him. Sometimes it's really red hot. And sometimes it's kind of cold, isn't it, whenever I think about my love for him. And I'm sure you're the same way. And so from time to time, perhaps every single day, we need to renew our love with him. And so hopefully you have found Hosea chapter 10. I'm sorry that, you know, that may be a little difficult to find. You'll find it on PowerPoint this morning. But if you can find Hosea, we'll walk you through the rest of these other passages that we will be looking at this morning. Let's all stand. Let's pray. Let's ask God to speak to us today. Everybody okay this morning? I know I ask you that every week just about, but I want to make sure we're together. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your love. and We thank you, Lord, that our response to you is to love you back. Lord, you have made us different than all of the creation. You've made us into your image. We have the ability to know you, Lord, to feel you, to receive you to love you, to worship you. We thank you, Lord, for the relationship that we have with you through your Son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you for every person in this place today, every person that is watching online right now. And we pray that today, Lord, through your power of your Holy Spirit, that you'd speak to us through your word and through the message that you have for us on this Lord's Day. We believe you have a message for each and every one of us. Father, use me today in a way that only you can, and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to share about experiencing spiritual renewal with God. Have you noticed that our Heavenly Father wants us to have a close relationship with Him? It's the reason why he sent Jesus to the cross and we experience forgiveness of our sins and we can receive him into our life. He longs for us to enjoy an intimate connection in our spiritual walk. You know, if we're honest today, we would admit that in each of our journeys with the Lord that there are seasons when our prayers are dry, our walk is inconsistent, and our fellowship is distant. That's true for every believer that has ever followed Christ. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verses 26 through 29, Ezekiel says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God, and I will deliver you from all of your uncleanness. God wants us to have passion for him. He wants us to be passionate about our relationship. He desires for us to be passionate about the things that he is passionate about. He wants us to be passionate about the things that he loves and that he cares about. It was Wesley Duell who said, All other passions build upon or flow from your passion for Jesus. A passion for souls grows out of a passion for Christ. A passion for missions builds upon a passion for Christ. He says the most crucial danger to a Christian, whatever his role, is to lack a passion of Christ. And then he goes on to say, the most direct route to personal renewal and new effectiveness is a new all-consuming passion for Jesus. And then he prays these words, Lord, give us this passion, whatever the cost. Saying, Lord, help us to be passionate for you. Help us not to be lukewarm. Help us not to be laissez-faire. But, Lord, help us to be passionate in our relationship with you. The question today is, are you passionate about God and the things that are important to him? 
Because if you've lost your passion, if I've lost my passion, then we need spiritual renewal. The story is told about a young student who went to his spiritual teacher and he asked the question. He said, Master, he said, how can I truly find God? The teacher asked the student to accompany him to the river that ran next to their village and invited him to go into the water. And when they got into the middle of the stream, the teacher said, please immerse yourself in the water. Well, the student, not knowing what was about to happen, obviously, did as the master instructed. And, and then the master teacher put his hands on that student and he held him under the water. Well, the student began to struggle. The master held him even longer. A, a moment passed by. That student started thrashing and beating the water in the air with his arms. And still the master held him under a little longer than that. And then finally, he took his hands off of him. That student released and shot up from the water Lungs aching and gasping for air, and the teacher waited for a few moments, and then he said, when you desire God as truly as you desire to breathe the air you just breathe, then you will find him. It's that kind of a desire. Have you ever been there where you are that passionate to know him and to follow him and to walk with him. How badly do you want spiritual renewal with the Lord? How badly do you want that kind of desire, that kind of walk with him? Do you, do you want it as much as your next breath? Maybe a better question right now would be, do you want it as much as you want lunch today, right? I mean, how bad do you want spiritual renewal? It's the deciding factor because when we do want God to renew us as much as we desire our next breath, he will begin to challenge us and invite us to experience some awesome things. He will take us places that we've never been to in our journey with him. And the truth of the matter is that so often we have moved in our relationship with God. That we move not towards him but away from him. And the only way to get back is to return to him. To figure out where we got off track. To figure out where we made the wrong turn. And to get back to that place in our walk with Christ. He is the one that we need. And so this morning, I want us to, to make sure that we are ready for what God wants to do as we renew our walk with Him. And, and here today, I want you to see three things that God wants us to experience and three things that we must do for this to take place. The first thing we must do is to open our heart. You must open your heart. Look in Hosea chapter 10 right here in verse 12. The Bible says, Sow for yourselves righteousness. Uh, recap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. For us to experience spiritual renewal, there must be personal transparency. We must open our hearts to God and allow him to begin working in us. Catherine Marshall said it like this, the single most important element in any human relationship is honesty with oneself, with God, and with others. That it begins with honesty. Did you know that there are no perfect Christians? Did you know that? There are no perfect Christians. Maybe you didn't realize that today. There are no perfect pastors either. By the way, you knew that already, I'm sure. But even the most mature believers has areas that need to be given to the Lord. There's no perfect Christians. Maybe people try to act like they're perfect from time to time. Maybe you might do that too. But, but there are no perfect Christians. None of us are perfect. I heard about a man who once asked a friend why he never got married. He said, I'm looking for the perfect girl. He said, surely you've met at least one girl that, that you wanted to marry. He said, yes. He said, and, and she was perfect in every single way. He said, then why didn't you marry her? He said, well, that's the problem. She was looking for the perfect man. <laughs> you know, some people think they're perfect. But you'll notice that we tend to hold back with our imperfections. We tend to hold back 
when it comes to our sins. We want his forgiveness, but we don't always desire to confess our shortcomings and failures. We want forgiveness, but we don't want confession. In 1 John chapter 1 and verses 8 through 10, John calls us to open our hearts to God when he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. It is a call to transparency. It is a call to open our hearts and say, Lord, I, I'm far from perfect. And these are the things in my life that I'm given to you because I want to experience your forgiveness. I want to know you in this way. I, want, I don't want anything to hinder my walk with you. Spiritual renewal only comes when we have brought the things to God that have caused us to live a stale Christian life. Maybe you're happy with stale. I don't know. But I don't like stale. I don't like stale when it comes to my food or anything else. And I sure don't like stale when it comes to my walk with God. It begins with being vulnerable and transparent with the Lord to make sure that we are honest with Him. True freedom begins when we are honest with the King about our guilt. That we say, God, this is my heart. He's the one who can restore us. He is the one who, who knows what we need. But it's whenever we open our hearts to him. Secondly, this morning, it's when we search his word. We search his word here in Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 18. It is a call for us to, to take his word. And to allow it to be the, the litmus test, the, the mirror that we look into, not looking at each other or, or someone else, but to, to look in his word and allow it to, to really inspect us and show us where we stand with him. In Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 18, the Bible says, Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. It's in the Word of God that we discover the heart of God. It's where we find the heart of God. Not a, not a list of do's and don'ts. But the things that please God. We find His character. We find His nature, don't we? We find His attributes. All of those things point to the personality of God. We, we find out who He is. And as a result, our desire is to be like Him. The Bible is not only our guide for life, but it also reveals what pleases our Father. Can you imagine trying to, to please God and, and not have His Word? To try to figure out what pleases our Heavenly Father and, and not have any idea of what that looks like? You'll notice that Moses wanted the people to be constantly exposed to the Word of God. He wanted it in front of them all of the time. He wanted their hearts and their souls and their hands and their eyes to be impacted by God's message. You'll see here that it is a call to lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. Look what he says, and bind them as a sign on your hand between your eyes, I mean, in, in every single way, he wanted the, the Word of God to, to run in and through these believers. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17, Paul is writing to his young protege in the faith, Timothy. Most scholars say that there's about a 30-year difference between the two. Paul's probably in his 60s at this point. Timothy's probably in his 30s. And he says this to his young protege, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I love that word all, don't you? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That everything that we read in his word, listen, I've said it like this, from, from the very front of my Bible where it has my name to the back where it says genuine leather, just in case you didn't know, I believe it all. 
from one cover to the next, that the Word of God has been given to us in all Scripture, not some Scripture, not most Scripture, but all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, that God led godly men to, to write His Word. And God wants us to search His Word because... As a result, he will begin to show us what is in our hearts and our souls. And he calls us to obedience. Because the word of God is not only for information, as you well know. It's for transformation. It is to, to move us, to, to help us to, to live for him. Not just to be really smart Southern Baptists and really intelligent Christians, but to be obedient to take the things that we read and that we know and to say, God, do that in my life. God, do that in my home. Do that at my job. Lord, do that through me. Not just something that I read about that happened a long time ago, but God, do that in me right now where I live, the places that I go, the people that I talk to. May you begin to transform my life, not just for information. We have to have information to be transformed. But it doesn't stop there, does it? That we say, God, not only transform my mind and my heart, but God, transform all of my life. That, that your word would just search me, and as a result, that I begin to, to live like you, to, to look like you, to represent you, that, Lord, I'm, I'm more like you than I've ever been, more like you today than I was a, a year ago. Five years ago, ten years ago, that there's Christ-likeness. I, I see a pattern, not just more knowledge, but, Lord, more obedience. I mean, that really shows us whether or not we're on our way, doesn't it? Whether or not I look more like Christ. That's really the, the bottom line, whether or not I'm obedient to him. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 12 and 13, the writer of Hebrews says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give account. Isn't that true? That the word of God is sharper and more powerful than any two-edged sword. It's able to, to open our hearts. It's able to expose them for, for what they really are. And it begins to, to not only provide uh, healing power, but allow us to be more and more like Christ. I love what Mark Twain said. I, I totally agree with his statement. This is so true in my life. He said, most people are bothered by those passages of Scripture they do not understand. He says, but the passages that bother me are those I do understand. <laughs> There's a lot of passages I don't understand, even after all these years. It's, it's really alarming. I think to myself, wow, I should, I should know more at this point than I do, I think, and, and I need to grow more in my walk with him. But it's those passages that I do understand that keep me up at night. It's those passages I do understand that, that causes me to, to wrestle and to say, God, help me to live that out. God, help me to be obedient to you. Do you know what happens when we search his word? God begins to challenge us, and he invites us to spiritual transformation. He begins to transform us that through the power of his word and our simple surrender, that we begin to experience spiritual healing and God begins to do a great work. Isaac Lambati was a tribesman. He laid paralyzed there on his left side. Isaac had prayed countless prayers to the, the Hindu gods asking for healing, but, but nothing ever happened to Isaac. And then eventually he came upon the Gospel of Mark. It was the only scripture translated in his native language. And he talks about how his heart was quickened with hope as he read that Jesus had healed. Remember that paralytic in Mark chapter 2 that was lowered through the roof by his four friends? He says, Jesus, you healed that paralytic man. Please heal me. Well, time passed. Isaac continued to pray. And then first he noticed feeling in his limbs. Then he could move his hand, then his entire arm. 
And within a few weeks, he got out of bed and he walked out of his house. Everyone that saw him, they proclaimed, the Hindu gods healed you? Everybody was proclaiming that message. And he went around and Isaac said, no, it wasn't the Hindu gods that healed me. It was the God of this book holding the gospel of Mark. And he said, he is the one true God. Can I say today that not only does he physically heal in circumstances today, but he also spiritually heals. He heals the hearts of his people. And when we begin to take his word and we begin to pray with all of our being for spiritual renewal and healing, God will respond to our plea. There is no doubt in my mind God wants to heal his people through spiritual healing. There's a third thing I want you to notice. Not only open your heart and search his word, but when you do, you'll find true renewal. In James chapter 4 and verse 8, here James gives a great promise to us. It's one of those conditional promises that we find in Scripture. There are many promises that we find in God's Word, and they are conditional. It's dependent upon our response to what God is asking us to do. And here in James chapter 4, at the beginning of verse 8, probably a familiar verse to many of you today, uh, James says, draw near to God, and here's the response, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We have an awesome promise from Almighty God that when we draw near to him, that he will draw near to us. There's never one time when I draw near to God and God doesn't move. That every time I draw near to him, God always responds to the movement of his children. He always responds to the movement of his people. One of the hardest things for us to admit, but is so vital to refreshing, is acknowledging that we have drifted away in some areas in our walk with God. To admit, to confess, Lord, I've, I've drifted it in my walk with you, that we're not as close to him as we have been in the past. In fact, the writer of Hebrews writes about drifting. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. I mean, those believers had heard so many things about Christ, how to follow him, how to obey him, how, what pleases him, how to walk with him, But it was a call to make sure that they would heed those things that they had heard lest they drift away. All of us uh, can drift away from time to time. Have you ever experienced drifting? Have you ever experienced drifting? Maybe you were out on the lake, some of you who are boaters, and and you were out on the lake, and maybe you just kind of sat out there on your boat for a while. Maybe you're fishing. I know, Warren, you fished a lot through the years. It's just, just drifting. I've shared with you before, growing up, my dad sold our power boat when I was about 13 years old for a sailboat. I thought that was the worst idea in all the world. We used to ski and hydro slide and, and, and fish offshore. And then one day, one of the guys at the plant bought a sailboat. My dad was inspired, and he thought, well, we'll, we'll sell our power boat and get a sailboat. We used to go out on Lake Charles all the time. That was long before I became a Christian and we went to church. And, and so we would spend our weekends on the lake. And we'd go out there on Lake Charles and, and my parents would pick up something to eat or we would grill on, on the boat. And, and my dad, he always knew what was going on around us, but sometimes he would put the anchor out. But sometimes, you know, he'd take the sails down and, and we'd eat a sandwich or drink a Coke and we would just sit out there and visit. And I know he was the captain. He was a good captain, by the way. He was paying attention to everything that was going on around us. But as a kid, as a teenager, I was just focusing on my Coke and my sandwich probably, not really paying attention. And every now and then I'd look up. You know what I'd notice? We drifted. You know, from one side of the lake maybe to the middle of the lake. It's only about two and a half miles wide. It's not a very big lake at all. But I would notice that, oh, my goodness, We drifted some more. Sometimes we were drifting kind of close to the Civic Center, to the seawall. Sometimes we were getting a little close to Shell Beach Drive or maybe over towards the port or towards North Beach. But that boat, that 30-foot sailboat, 
It would drift. I mean, the water would just kind of move us around. That's true in our Christian life. If we don't pay attention and really watch what's taking place, we will drift in our relationship with God. Drifting is so subtle. It's so surprising. It's so quiet. But before long, if we're not paying attention, we will be farther away from God than we've ever been. We need to throw an anchor out, don't we? The anchor is the Word of God. We need the anchor of hope to to anchor our lives. Without the Word of God and that anchor holding us in place, we will drift with the wind. We will drift with the waves. We will just drift across life. And no telling where we will end up, we may even end up on the rocks and destroy the ship if we're not careful. God offers his grace and mercy when that happens. He welcomes us back home. He simply wants us to draw near to him, not to drift away from him, but he wants us to draw near to him. He just wants a close relationship with us. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, The Bible says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That God wants us to draw near to him. He doesn't want us to do more good works. He's not calling us for, to have better church attendance, which I love when you're here and we worship together. He's not saying you you need to serve in a hundred different places or give a certain amount of offering or whatever it is that comes to your mind. He just wants us to draw near to him. I love that term, draw near, because you know what? There's nothing like it. If you're a parent or a grandparent or maybe you're an uncle or an aunt here today, well, there's, there's nothing like it, is there? When your kids or your grandkids or your nieces or nephews, when they actually want to be with you. I mean, just just recently, I experienced that with both of our kids in, in two different ways. Just drawing near to you, wanting to spend that time. God loves when we draw near to him. Bruce Wilkerson tells of a time in his walk with God. When he felt that he was drifting, nothing seemed to give him that close feeling. You'll remember that he wrote the book, The The Prayer of Jabez, and, and also The Vine, John chapter 15. He says, during that time, he had a spiritual awakening. He said, I was a teacher, I was a writer, I was a leader. He said, yet I learned this. God didn't want me to do more for him. He wanted me to be more with him he didn't want me to do more for him he wanted me to do to 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 be more with him to be more with him you know if we're not careful I don't know about you I'm a doer that's just the way I'm wired that's the way God made me it really is I'm a doer that's the way I am many times in life and if I'm not careful my Christian life is about doing, checking the boxes, right? Getting those things done. And ministry has a way of doing that to you where there's a lot of things that need to be done. If I'm not careful, I'll do a lot of doing and I won't do a whole lot of being, just being with him. God wants us to begin with just being with him. About the relationship, nurturing that relationship with Christ. Now, out of that relationship is the doing. But it starts with just being, being with him, enjoying that relationship with Christ and knowing that whenever we draw near to God, isn't that something? When I draw near to God, the promise is he will draw near to me. There's never been a time when I have gotten close to him when he did not respond. Max Lucado said it in such a beautiful way which he always does, he says, if there are a thousand steps between us and him, he will take all but one, but he will leave the final one for us. The choice is ours. He takes 99 steps. I mean, he he goes as far as he can, but eventually you have to take a step towards him. But when you draw near to him, 
Listen, he'll take all of those steps towards you. That's what God does. In Luke chapter 15, as I close today, turn with me there if you don't mind. We find the the story of the the lost coin, the the lost sheep. But we also find the the story, the, the parable of the lost son. We call him the prodigal son because he left home. He took his inheritance. This Jewish boy was the youngest of the boys, probably got about a third of the inheritance, and he left home, and he spent it all, and not in a very good way at all. And then he ends up, this Jewish boy, remember, in a pig pen of all places, starving to death. His friends were gone because his money was gone. And he had nobody there to help him. But I want you to notice in this parable that eventually he decided to draw near to his earthly father. He decided to go home. And really the parable is not only about the prodigal son. It's really about the response of the earthly father. Look what he says here in Luke chapter 15 and verse 18. The Bible says, I will rise. Best thing he ever said. I will rise and go to my father. And say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven And in your sight, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, look at verse 22, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hands and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. That's how we know they were Baptists, by the way. And let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Notice the response of not the prodigal son. Notice the response of the father. Notice that this Jewish father, that when he saw him in verse 20, that when he was a great way off, that his father saw him, he had compassion, and this Jewish father, which Jewish men did not do, right, he ran. And he fell on his neck, and he kissed him. He was so glad that his, fa- his son finally made it home. And then they threw the biggest party you can imagine. He went and got the, the robe and the ring and the sandals. All of those things represented sonship, that he was back home. They killed the fatted calf, and they celebrated. I'm not sure how long that party lasted, but it lasted a long time. They celebrated that the son had come home. You know, it begins with one step towards home and the father. When that prodigal son said, I will arise and go to my father in verse 18, that was the first step towards home. That was the first step towards forgiveness. When we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. When that prodigal son made his way home, that father did not just stand on that front porch and wait for him to to come up, did he? He didn't wait for him to to finally step on that front porch or to knock on that front door. He didn't do that at all. You'll notice that when he saw him, that he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. That's what God does in your life and my life. I'm not sure what kind of image you have of our Heavenly Father when, when we fall away from him or we drift away from him. But listen, we have a God who is full of mercy, a God who is full of grace. We have a God who literally runs to us and restores us, and He wants us to be home because He loves us so much. We are to draw near to Him, and James says He will draw near to us. There are some ways we can live this out on this Lord's Day. The first thing I want to encourage you to do is to trust in His love. Trust in His love. You can trust in God's love. Maybe you've been hurt along the way by other people, but listen, His love is unconditional. 
His love is unending. His love is undeserved. It's a different kind of love. It's, it's from above. But not only that, I hope that you know how much he loves you. I hope that you know that he can forgive you. That God has the power to bring forgiveness to your life. But not only trust in his love, but look at your heart. In what areas do you need renewal? In what areas do you need renewal? Maybe you just came to church today and you're thinking, Pastor, I wasn't even thinking about this. It wasn't even on my radar. But now it is. To begin asking God, Lord, in what areas of my life am I dry? In what areas of my Christian walk with you am I stale? In what areas of my Christian life have I left home? Maybe not completely, but some areas in your life and my life where we need restoration. Ask God to, to reveal your heart. What does it look like? Not just to you, but what does it look like to him? He'll show you. Thirdly, be honest with God. He, he already knows the diagnosis. Confess your sins to him. Experience forgiveness and freedom. But be honest with him. Say, God, show me my heart. Show me my life. Expose it like, like the scripture tells us in Hebrews where the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. May you just, just lay my heart open. Show me my heart today. And then fourthly and finally, live close to him. Live closer to the Lord than ever. And no joy, uh, renewed excitement, uh, fresh dedication to get back to that first love that, that maybe you haven't experienced in, in years, maybe since you first became a, a follower of Christ, because God longs for us to be in a close relationship with Him, the closest relationship in all the world. And He says that when we draw near to Him, isn't that beautiful? That when we draw near to Him, that when we draw near to Him, He will draw near to to us. That's a promise, and we find it in the Word of God. Father, we thank you for your Word today. We thank you, Lord, that when we drift away from you, that, Father, you have the ability to, to call us back to yourself. You have the ability to show us where we have erred. And we pray today, Lord, that you would just show us our hearts, show us where we have drifted, Help us, Lord, to hear your voice and to follow you. And I thank you, Lord, today for your grace. I thank you that you don't just abandon us and three strikes you're out and turn us away. It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. We thank you, Lord, that when we leave home like that prodigal son, that you long for our return and you actually celebrate. When we make it home, no questions asked. That's grace. Help us to be that way with one another. Help us to be that way with people that you've brought to us. I pray for those that have never trusted you as their Savior in this service. Those watching online have never given their lives to you. And Father, today they can experience that kind of love. It begins with asking you, to come into their life, to be their Savior, to be their Lord, to forgive them of their sins, and to make a commitment to follow you. I pray for those here today in this place that have never made that decision. As we begin to sing in a moment, Lord, may they make that commitment. May they draw near to you. Just draw near to you. And as they draw near to you, by asking you into their lives, Father, you will draw near to them. You've never turned anyone away. I pray for all Christians in this place today. Father, help us to be honest and open to you. That We would pray that you would show us, Lord, where we've drifted. Help us to begin to come back to you and renew that relationship. We pray for those looking for a church home, a place to serve, commit their lives, to grow, to help reach this community. And Father, I pray if you're leading them to this place, Lord, that they would say yes to you on this Lord's day. Father, we thank you for what you have done. And we pray that you would help us to be like that clay in Jeremiah chapter 18 with the potter. 
Help us to be, be moldable, usable in the hands of the great potter. We pray this and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Why don't you stand?